Please open your Bibles to Psalm 19. And as you turn there, let me just remind you that uh, all hell is endeavoring to shake your soul. And wouldn't have to go past the first effort to not only shake, but to uh, utterly destroy you. But praise God, our Lord says, I will, the soul that on Jesus trust, never, no, never, no, never forsake. Amen. And that's not because we're worth not being forsaken. <laughs> that's because God is God. Psalm 19 is a word that tells us who God is, and it does so by relating the, the value of the revelation of God to us, both generally and specially, generally being in creation and our experiences in creation, specially being the Word of God, the written Word of God, and let me just say the Bible, the books of Genesis uh, to Malachi, the Law, the Prophets, and the Writings, and also the, the New Covenant books, Matthew to Revelation. And that's it. <laughs> there aren't any others, okay? That, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about God's revelation of himself in Scripture. I want to remind you that Scripture is inherently written, okay? It's script. It is wor words that have been inscripturated, and that's what we're going to be talking about. Now, we're going to read all of Psalm 19. Um, we, we want to see the connection. I want you to note the, uh, the use of the word God as the, the one who is glorified. He's the God of creation. He's the one that all mankind, uh, to whom all mankind is accountable. But when we know him as he has revealed himself, especially in Scripture, uh, the, in the scripture here, the word for our God is Yahweh, the covenant name of God. So let's look here in Psalm 19 and be taught about the truth of God as expressed by God. Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor their words, whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber. Like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of Yahweh is perfect. Reviving, and may I say that we could say restoring or converting the soul. That's, that's what's behind here. I'll leave off preaching for now and go back to reading. <laughs> this, the, the testimony of Yahweh is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of Yahweh are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of Yahweh is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of Yahweh is clean, enduring forever. The rules of Yahweh are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Yahweh my rock, and my redeemer. Illuminate our hearts to the truth by the power of your Holy Spirit. I pray in the name of our crucified and risen Lord Jesus. Amen. 
Now we're, we're absolutely dependent on the illumination of God's Holy Spirit. But as born again people, and I trust that many, I trust that the majority of us, I desire that all of us in the room would be. If we are, then when we read a passage like this, the Holy Spirit testifies and says, this is true. It's, it's true. Truth. 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 And all of the, uh, I use my word again, that we battalions of new atheists and supposed scholars giving us all of their arguments cannot defeat the truth because it's the truth. Now, last week we, uh, I, I guess I could say I exulted in uh, declaring what we find in verses 1 to 6, and we're going to go focusing in on verse 7, special revelation, but let us remind ourselves that as we look for truth, we cannot look within. We cannot look to our personal preferences, even our, our, our uh, heartfelt convictions apart from, from God. If we're just looking at the heart of man, when God made his list of the most deceitful things that he knew of, and by the way, he knows of all of them, what's number one? The human heart. The heart is deceitful above all things. Don't go there. Instead, later on in Jeremiah... He gives us the correct approach, and he says this, Jeremiah 23, 37, Thus you shall say, every one to his neighbor and every one to his brother, What has Yahweh answered? Or what has Yahweh spoken? That's the question. The wonderful, great news is, uh, when we do that, we can leave the shamans and the philosophers and the thinkers and the list makers and the rule makers, uh, and the religious taskmasters, we don't even need to hear from them because we have in front of us copies of the preserved, written word of God with the words of God in them. We don't, we're not left to wonder about generically right and wrong. It's defined for us and put in writing. God has sent you this revelation of, of himself, and you enjoy and benefit from, if you are in Christ, ministries of people like Moses, Abraham, Moses, David, the 12. I mean, we, we get to, it's here. Their ministry is preserved for us, and the best part of their ministry was not their personalities or even their spiritual gifts or anything like that. The best part of their ministries or that they declared the word of God. We've got the best part of all of the, those who have gone before us written down for us. Now let's look at what we've got here. Let's look at the, the special revelation of God. Starting in verse 7. I want to tell you, I heard a, a mid-America guy, Trevor, say one time, <laughs> tell them what you're going to tell them. Tell them what you're going to tell them. And then tell them what you told them. <laughs> That's preaching. Uh, so this is what I'm going to tell you. I, and I, I seek to labor to tell you nothing more than what the Holy Spirit has inspired to be written here. Um, but we're going to look at the descriptions of God's Word. We're going to look at the attributes of God's Word. The efficacy of God's Word. And uh, that just means how, that it is effective. It is effective. We're going to look at the value of God's Word, the benefits of God's Word. We're going to look at the witness of Scripture to Scripture. We're going to look at the necessity of God's Word, the sufficiency and inspiration of God's Word, the origin of God's Word, the eternality of God's Word. And then we're going to look at the saving result of God's revelation that are in down, down in the bottom. And here we are in the book of the Psalms. Uh, maybe a thousand years or maybe more, I, depending on, uh, well, this is David, a thousand years. A thousand years, say, for the time of Christ. And we've got a description right here in this text of justification, sanctification, and glorification. And then a final prayer 
expressing a heartfelt desire for real fellowship with God. And that's the result of the Word of God. The Word of God makes that happen. The Word of God brings about, we just read it in James, right? Of his own will, he brought us forth by the Word of truth. The Word brings about justification, sanctification, glorification, and puts the people of God into perfect fellowship with God. That, I don't have anything else to offer. <laughs> That's the highest stuff I can think of. Perfect fellowship with God. That's where we're headed. Cannot get there. Cannot get there outside of the Word of God. Okay, so this is necessary. Let's look and see. First of all, let's look at the, the descriptions of God's Word. We've got these words in, in verses uh, 7 and 8, uh, 9 and 10. Here are the words that describe, uh, they, are, they are terms that refer to God's Word. Law, testimony, precepts, commandment, and here's one that's different, fear and rules are judgments. That word for rules, you could think of it as judgments, pronouncements. That's what, that's what is graciously provided for you. Start asking the philosophy questions. Why are we here? Is there a God? Who is God? And the Bible, we can put in your hand and say, now here's what you've got. When you've got this, here's what you've got from God. You've got his law, his testimony, his precepts, his commandment, his fear, his rules. Seems like a lot we've got. <laughs> that, seems, that seems important, right? Think about the word law for just a moment. Now, David referred specifically and used the word Torah. Torah, which uh, technically is going to refer to the first five books of the Bible, the books of Moses, the books of the law. And as we were talking, Trevor, they're often thought of, they need to be, I think, thought of as a unit. Uh, don't need to try to, to make sense of the book of Leviticus just as an independent book, as if it's not related to the other four books of the Torah. It's, we need to see it that way. Uh, biblical references to that unit abound. Sometimes it's just Moses said. Moses said or something like that. So that's the word that David used, but there is an expansion and often when the law of the Lord is referenced, the Torah, it, it would include the books of Moses and everything God has said. We, we don't take the words of God and, and rank them as these we need to listen to. This is optional. If God says it, we need to know it. We need to hear it. So let us not be so specific that we try to cut the, the Torah out of the rest of Scripture and, and then start questioning the perfection of the rest of Scripture. And we've got other passages that, that talk about other parts of Scripture being perfect anyway. So. so the law of the Lord is perfect, and I encourage you to make sure that you have that view of the Bible. Uh, I would say if you don't have that view of the Bible, I have very little hope that you'll end up in verse 14. I don't even think it's possible. Um, I, I don't think it's possible. It's, I'll just say it this way. If you say, well, there are errors and mistakes and contradictions in the Bible, then we have no hope of knowing how to have fellowship with God. If it's not what it says it is, we got nothing. That's what it comes down to. The evidence is overwhelming that it is what it says it is. And let's start with this piece of evidence. The Bible nails you. It nails it. it. It describes perfectly who you are. And we know it. And we experience it every day. Right now, you could think of something that has happened recently in which, which you think there was some injustice. In which you think somebody got treated unfairly. In which you think that should have been more, that should have been less. You think the, the balances of what's going on here is not... This is, this is all wrong. Uh, 
Uh, there is stuff in life that we have that approach to, right? Guess what the Bible says about life? <laughs> Read Ecclesiastes. Vanity. It's not possible. You cannot. You can work. You can pursue pleasure. You can. You can. De- Discipline yourself and pursue career and job and building and, and infrastructure at like, a, like a king would. And build, let's build a nation. Let's just do this stuff. And then at the end of the day, do you do know what Solomon concluded, right? Let us, and he said here at the conclusion of the whole matter in the last two verses of the book of Ecclesiastes, fear God and keep his commandments. That's the conclusion of the whole matter. We're talking about law. Read it, brothers and sisters, and recognize your guilt. Start with the one that Jesus said is the greatest. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. Who among us would dare Say that you've even approached that. We have not. John recognizes that, well, that may be abstract and there may be some some people out there that might deceive people into thinking that they've done that because that's abstract, because we haven't seen God. All right, let's go to the second greatest commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now that'll shut up everybody. not happening is it and yet look at what's said about the law the law of the Lord is perfect converting the soul now that doesn't mean that the way you get saved is keeping the law what that means is um, it is the perfect standard it what Jesus told the rich young ruler keep the commandments and I'll just tell you if you were conceived born and lived in perfect conformity to the law, you would be received into God's court in heaven as one who deserves to be there. That's the standard. But see, Jesus is the only one who ever did that. That's why we need to be in Christ. Getting ahead of myself. Let me, let me tell you this. Let's look at the attributes of God's word. Uh, one more word on the word fear. We have to admit, technically, that's not a word that, that, that describes a written document Except it is here. If you read the Bible honestly and in the power of the Holy Spirit, you will experience an appropriate fear of God. If you have never experienced fear of God, you don't know who He is. You don't know who He is. Uh, it's a good time to note that when we talk about being saved, we need to ask the question because you might be asked by just an interested, curious person. You're talking about salvation and being saved. Saved from what? That's a really good opportunity to go straight to, here's the problem. We need to be saved from God. Paul Washer priest, the, the, the worst news for sinners is that God is good. That's bad news for bad people which all of us are. But it's good news that the good God is a good Savior. That's good news. So the law is not, the law is not seen in this passage as it, and its condemnation. I mean, this is a person writing who has the heart to write verse 14. He sees the law as establishing the standard. God... We'll redeem his people. We trust him. Let's obey him. The law of Yahweh is perfect, converting the soul. So we got, we got law, testimony, precepts, commandment, fear, and rules. That's what we've got when we hold the Bible in our hands. You don't have to go ask anybody else about that stuff. You've got it when you've got the Bible. What we do here, pretty much our mission is to help you understand what this book says. <laughs> that's, the big, that's the big idea. When we do that, we can sing songs that communicate truth from this word. We can pray prayers that communicate truth 
from this book. We can, we can preach sermons that communicate truth from this book, and we can teach lessons, and we can have friendships. We can, have, uh, we can serve. We can clean the bathrooms. Uh, we can write curriculum. We can do everything according to the truth that's in this book, and that's really all that matters. We can sing. If we're not singing according to the truth in this book, we can preach, but if we're not the, preaching the truth of this book, praying, worth nothing. As a matter of fact, it'll be an indictment against us on the judgment day. We got to know what's in this book. And we've got it. Law, testimony, precepts, commandment, fear, rules. There's no other source you need. It's perfect. We got what we need. Sufficient. Okay, look at the attributes of God's word. From these phrases here, we get these words. Perfect, sure, right, pure, clean. And, and this phrase is, is kind of used in one spot in the in the stanzas of, of the Hebrew, true and righteous all together. I like that one, true and righteous all together, just the whole thing, all of it. It's, it's both true and it's righteous. It's true and it's righteous. Let me see if I can think of an example of something that's true but not righteous. Sometimes Ole Miss wins a sports game. So I can admit that's true. I don't consider it righteous in any sense of the word. I got a fellow Bulldog fan over here. That one's a funny one. But, but the word of God is both true and righteous. That's what makes it a problem if we don't believe it. Because it's both true and righteous. But praise God, it's perfect, it's sure, it's right, it's pure, it's clean, and, and nobody has ever been able to successfully make any kind of argument against those descriptions of God's word, the, those attributes. Nobody yet has said that what Jesus taught is imperfect, unsure, wrong, impure, filthy, false, and sinful. I, I'm not even aware of very many efforts to do that. As a matter of fact, the opposite of true. The world religions race to see who can say more good things about Jesus. The Buddhists will tell you, oh, Jesus. Hinduism, Jesus. Islam, Jesus. Mormonism, Jesus. Even some atheists will say, well, yeah, he had some good moral teaching. People are reluctant to talk bad about Jesus. And by the way, this is important. It's related to the Bible because you know what Jesus said? He came speaking only the words that the Father gave him. And he said, I'm giving them to you. And then I'm going to go away and I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. You can't bear everything I have to say right now. And then he's going to reveal to you the testimony of me and the things that are to come. And, and we've got it. Here it is. <laughs> no, have you ever noticed that? Very few people just casually throw out insults at Jesus. But we've got to know Jesus based on who Jesus said he is. Not that what not what salves our conscience. Okay, what I need to do is say something good about Jesus so I can continue in my life that is impure, unclean, unrighteous. And I don't want any judgment on that, but I mean, I don't want to say something bad about Jesus. That's a weird place people find themselves. Do you know why? It's because... We may be fallen and depraved, but we can make sense and think logically, and we read the Bible, and it's true. The fact that it's true falls on everybody. The people who pursued Jesus to death, the religious leaders in Israel, do you think they would have been upset if he walked around saying, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life? They would have said, check that guy out. And moved on. But they knew what he is saying we cannot refute. They tried, they plotted, they sent people and said, ask him this, ask him that. And they realized what all of the people said. We've never heard anything like this before. Did you know that that's still happening? The Bible's effect on people is not, well, clearly that's wrong. They may say it, but when you ask them, okay, what is the thing that's clearly wrong? 
Never have I been given an answer to that. I have multiple times, many times been told the Bible's wrong. All right, show me. Well, I mean, I haven't read the Bible. <laughs> there is a universal failure among the rebels against God to demonstrate one falsehood in his word. So I say, this stands, the, that the law, the testimony, the precepts, the commandment, the fear, and the rules of God are perfect, sure, right, clean, true, and righteous altogether. It stands, it's true, that's what it is, and we have to come to grips with that. That's what it is. That's what it is. Let me just say this. If there was something clearly wrong in the Bible, every one of us would know what it is. That'd be trumpeted, blasted, uh, put out. I mean, look at the arrogance and the brazenness of those who deny it with not one shred of evidence that it's not true. Imagine if there was something in there that said like, well, Jesus was born in Jerusalem, which, by the way, the Book of Mormon says, and is just simply false, simply false. There's not one thing like that in the Bible, nothing even within a million miles of that in the Bible. If there were, we'd all know what it is, and it would be trumpeted, and cited over and over. As it is, they're acting like they're citing some scholarship or science or something, and there's nothing to it. There's no answer. What is it? What is it that proves the Bible not true? I don't know. I just, I just know the Bible's not true. But people know the Bible is true. Remember what we looked at in Romans 1? Psalm 19 connects to Romans 1, and Romans 1 says, No, they've clearly perceived. It has been shown to them. They are without excuse that there is a God, and they know his divine nature and his eternal power. They know it. This is why all the cultures in the world do something to try to appease whoever that may be. They don't know who it is, but they know, they know there's some being with divine nature and eternal power universally. They know it. We know it. That's not enough to save us, though, and that's why we're reading about this. Isn't this great? We, the Bible, you get into much more detail and have to deal with who you are a lot more than when you just go outside and look at the red rocks or look up and see the, the sun or at night the stars and say, the heavens declare the glory of God. There's somebody who made this, and he's awesome. But when we read the Bible, we start learning, yeah, and he's also perfect and righteous, and you're not. That's what we learn, and we need to know it. All right? The efficacy of God's word. What does it do? What, effect, what is affected by the Bible? Here's what it is. Reviving the soul. And we've noted that, that a better word would be uh, to, to, to put something back. I looked, started, did a little looking around on what is the word used here in the Hebrew. What is it? restoration, turning it back, converting, I think, is well within the, the scope of this word. Some translations say converting the soul. I think that's what the idea is here. It's the turning back. It's Say, why is it a turning back? Well, if you remember, Adam and Eve were created in perfect innocence. They had the potential to sin, but they had not sinned. They were innocent. But then they forfeited that standing. They had fellowship with God. Genesis describes that, right? In other words... The words of their mouths and the meditations of their heart were acceptable in God's sight as far as it went for them. They had the potential to sin, but they had not. They, had, they walked with God. They had fellowship. Then they lost it. So that's why the, word, it's, the idea is to bring it back. God is redeeming mankind. What else does it do? It makes wise the simple. What else does it do? It rejoices the heart. Now here's the other side of the fear part. Let me tell you. If you have never feared God by what you find in Scripture, you don't understand it. On the other hand, if you have not rejoiced in what you find in the Bible, you don't understand it. This is good news. This is salvation, redemption. This is you being freed from slavery in which you cannot uh, free yourself. Slavery that leads to the lake of fire. Chained with an unbreakable chain being carried off to an eternity in the lake of fire, and God shows up. That's, and he frees you in Christ. If you've never rejoiced in your heart over what the Bible teaches, you don't understand it well yet. 
enlightening the eyes. So, turns out it's not the philosophers that bring us enlightenment, the people who look within and use reason. It's, it's ironic. <clears throat> the people would say, well, we don't need to start with an idea of God. God is a man-made concept that has some meaning, but it's, it's, it's a man-made. You know what? The people who do that, they're using the brain, they're using the mind that God gave them to formulate that thought. Their brain is not self-existent. And that's the, that's, by the way, that's the next question. Okay, you've just formulated a thought. How did you do that? When, when did you start formulating thoughts? What about before that? See, we're depending on God. It doesn't take long to get, to run into the dead end on humanism. It doesn't, it's, it's, just ask a couple of questions, you're like, you know what? I saw a tree today, and I'm looking at you and listening to somebody else made that tree. You did not, we didn't, I didn't. I, I don't know. Something is going on here. So humanism won't get us there. But God's word gives us enlightenment. I like what it says, enlightening the eyes. It's like wide open eyes, aware enlightenment. Not narrow-minded, focused, inward, contemplative, monastic, ascetic. It's, it enlightens the eyes. It's like when we're enlightened by God, we can look around and make sense of all of it. Everything we take in, and it enlightens the eyes. Enduring forever. That's how effective it is. Now, that's good news. Isn't it good news that when we read... Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. And that word endures forever. If I'm not, if, unless I'm missing something, that means I'm saved and I'm saved, period. I'm saved. Yes. He brought me forth by the word of truth. His word endures forever, forever. He brought me forth by the word of truth. He declared righteous. That's the banner over God's people. Righteous. His word endures forever. That's what the Bible says. Amen? What about the value of God's word? Now here's one where God's people need to step up to the plate. We need to change our lifestyles, maybe. If you're out there chasing what they're selling, you've got to rearrange your priorities because you're living as if you don't agree with what we've just read. If the most important thing to you is your nest egg, uh, your bank account, then you're denying what we just read. Look what it says. Verse 10, more to be desired are they, and he, he means the, the, the law, testimony, precepts, commandment, fear, rules, more to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Now, I'm with, I believe that most of us think that if right now these doors open and some atheist guy, to prove a point, walked in and said, I've got, I got stacks of cash right out here. All you got to do to help yourself to all, whatever you want to say, I don't believe any of this stuff, and you just come and get it. I hope that we would all think, oh, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. Your gold perish with thee. I hope that that's what we are thinking, that's what we do. But how do you live your life? How do you approach giving to the Lord? Is it cheerful? Is it conditional? Do you try to negotiate with God? Don't do that. Here's what you need to show out to, to the world with the way you live, the way you handle finances, the way you handle everything. I love God with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, all my strength. I got nothing without him. I invest in his glory. That is the most valuable commodity in the universe, the glory of God. And when he's glorified, I'm satisfied. 
Do you live like that? Or do you try to negotiate? Is everything conditional? Well, maybe I'll do this. I met a lady uh, in uh, Moscow, Russia, on a trip with Dr. Wilkes. <clears throat> she said her leg was, was in bad shape. She, she, she needed to be healed. She listened to the gospel, and her idea was, you know what? Let's do this. I'm going to pray and ask God to heal my leg. And if he'll heal my leg, then I'll, I'll, I'll be a follower of Jesus. And I said, let me just tell you, if he wants to heal your leg, he'll heal it no matter what you think. It, so just understand, he can do whatever he wants to. I don't think he's going to take you up on what you just said. <laughs> he can do whatever he wants to. I cannot encourage you in that. This is what I can encourage you. If you think it's bad to have a hurt leg, you need to understand that the consequence for sin is to be tortured justly and righteously forever in the lake of fire. And what he says to you now is repent and believe. I'll free you from that. So you're, you're aiming a little low and you're trying to negotiate the one that gave you the breath with which to, to articulate that sentence. That's not a good approach. That's not a good approach. No, we need to desire not our physical well-being, and if he'll give me that, then I'll serve him. What we need to do is be like Job and say, though he slay me, yet I will praise him. There's nothing to do except recognize he's God. My only hope is God. We need to keep that thought in our mind. We need to, and that's by valuing the word of God for what it is. It's amazing how my flesh so quickly forgets that. I can so easily be distracted. It's so uh, nefarious, my flesh, so wicked. I can be distracted by the task of working on a sermon from love for God and concern for his glory. I've tried to wrap my mind to that, but I get in that place. And I'm like, this has become what I do on Tuesday. I need to get over here and do this. And, well, there's this word and there's that. And I don't mean that all, all that we do has to ha we have to be weeping and singing a, a song of praise. I'm just saying that it can happen. Anything can happen. And the devil is well pleased to let church replace God. He's fine with that. He'll great perfect. You trust church and not God and God won't get glory. You'll be glorifying church or religion or whatever. No, we need to value God's word. It's God's word by which he brings us forth. And that's, that's what we need. Joshua 1, 8 tells us the value of God's word. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. Note what he says. It doesn't say shall not depart from your reading desk shall not depart from your mouth, uh, for you shall meditate therein day and, uh, day and night, so that you might do according to all that is written therein. And then you shall make your way prosperous, and then you shall have good success. There's success. Sacrificing the word of God in the pursuit of success is a fool's errand. You've missed it. You're going the opposite direction from success. You might get some stuff, but what Jesus say? What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? The benefits of God's word here, they provide warning and they give direction toward great reward. Look at that. Verse 11, my, moreover by them is your servant warned. Now who is the warning coming from? is coming from not the people who are able to kill the body. Jesus recognized there are some people who are able to kill the body. There's folks riding around. There's bandits. There's armies and governments even. They, have the, they don't bear the sword in vain, he said. They're able to kill the body. He said, don't fear them. Fear the one who is able to kill the body and cast the soul into hell. That's who the warning is coming from. This God will never compromise his justice and he will by no means clear the guilty and he is warning you how to avoid being treated as guilty in his word. That is 
perfect integrity, is it not? He will not, he's, this, is the, this is the biblical phrase, by no means clear the guilty. He will by no means clear the guilty. And yet he has provided a substitute. Amen. A substitute on which he pours out justice and wrath and warns, trust him, you must be in Christ. That is the one who has suffered for you so that justice is satisfied and then mercy and grace flows freely to those who are in Christ. Perfect integrity. He warns us and he directs us toward, this is, this is getting too good. I mean, this, not only is he warning us so that we avoid wrath, look what he's doing. In keeping them, and by the way, he, he's the one that keeps, us, keeps it for us in Jesus, right? Jesus kept them perfect. But here's what we get for what Jesus did. There is great reward. There are New Testament passages with details about God rewarding you for the work that he did in your life. <laughs> he carried the load and then gave you a reward for the load getting where it needed to be. Well done, good and faithful servant. He's going to say to the servants who he carried along. He told the Israel, I'm carrying you. I'm carrying you along. He told them, I will circumcise your hearts and you will be my people. I will save you. Well done, good and faithful servant. <laughs> that's almost, it almost goes beyond, I mean, that's, that's God's economics right there. He directs us to reward. Praise God. All right, we're going to have to, we're going to, have to just note a few things uh, to wrap this up. But the witness of Scripture to Scripture is what we're looking at here. Scripture's telling us how good Scripture is. And that's important, by the way. If we were trying to say things about God's Word that God doesn't say about God's Word in God's Word, that'd be a problem. All we're saying, though, is here's what God's Word, this is what God said in God's Word about God's Word. That's what we're doing. It's necessary. We see, you need to understand that this passage is not like an Old Testament passage. This is a revelation of God to mankind passage. It is, there's evidence for it in the Scripture that happened chronologically before it and all the way to Revelation after it. Just a few examples. You read Romans 10, 14 to 17, and you see the necessity of God's word, which is clearly taught here. Uh, uh, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of Christ. Well, how are they going to hear? How are they going to believe in somebody they've never heard of? How are they going to hear unless somebody goes to teach them? We need somebody to preach, and we need somebody to preach something. What do we need preached? The word of Christ, because that's where faith comes from. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing what? The word of Christ. It's necessary. It's necessary. The sufficiency and inspiration of God's word, found in 2 Timothy 3, 15 to chapter 4, 2. All scripture is inspired by God. We believe in plenary verbal inspiration. That lines up word for word with all Scripture inspired by God. Plenary means all. Verbal means words or Scripture inspired by God, breathed out by God, given by God. It comes from God. The early church knew of the doctrine of the inspiration of Scripture. In Acts 4, they said this, Sovereign Lord, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit. That's a quote from Acts 4. Listen to that again. The early church, this, by the way, some of those who are being, uh, they claim to be wise, but they become fools. They've tried to tell us, well, the early church didn't believe in inerrancy and inspiration. It just wasn't even an issue to them. Y'all are, y'all are talking about stuff that wasn't even important back in Bible times. Listen again, Acts 4 Verse 25, in their prayer, they said these words, Sovereign Lord, 
And then they said some things. And then later on they said, who through the mouth of our father David, for example, like in this psalm, said, who said it? The sovereign Lord said it. Through the mouth of our, of, of our father David. And how did he say it? By the Holy Spirit. That's what we believe. That's what they believed. That's what we believe. That's what I'm preaching today. This is the word of God. That's what Christians have believed all along. And to believe anything less is sub-Christian. You're not a Christian. Christians don't believe that the Bible is untrue. The origin of God's word we read last week together. 2 Peter 1, 16 to 21. And Peter was there when this prayer was prayed. And of course then he said that holy men of old spoke as the Holy Spirit carried them along. He carried them along. He superintended what they wrote. Yeah, but we see evidence of human personality. Of course we do. We have different mouths. Peter's mouth didn't give us the same style as David's mouth. But it's still God who said it by the Holy Spirit. All right. Closing with this. Uh, the, what, the eternality of God's word. You need to read Isaiah 46 to 8. Eternality of God's word. But let's look just for a minute at the amazing truth of our salvation with descriptive phrases that describe what the New Testament tells us about our salvation. I was real excited to just see this. I had not noticed this before. Okay, verse 12. The question is, who can discern his errors? And by the way, that's not a capital H on the word his. He's not asking, he's not referring to God's errors. He's referring to the person. How am I supposed, I, how do I measure myself? He's listed all this wonderful stuff about the, the standard of God's word and then he says, but I can't, I don't even know how to measure myself, even with a perfect measure. I'm, I'm lost. I have errors. I don't even know how to discern them right. So here's his next prayer. <laughs> and, and, and the ch Christian churches have been criticized for imposing a, a, uh, a view of, of salvation that is Western and um, exemplified in Martin Luther's approach, like justification by faith. They said, no, you've missed it. It's not legal and stuff like that. It's just more organic. A lot of things are kind of moving toward that. It, no, let's let be, be more organic. Now, let me tell you something. This is legal right here. This is a guilt issue because look what he says next. This is way before Martin Luther. He says, declare me innocent from hidden faults. He's acknowledging hidden faults. He's just asked who can discern his errors. I'm not even aware of all the ways that I've offended you, God. So this is what I need. I don't need uh, a... He didn't say give me the list of all of them and I'll fix them. His prayer was declare me innocent. Declare me innocent. Genesis 15, 6 Abraham believed God, and God counted that as righteousness. He declared him righteous. Abraham didn't all of a sudden stop sinning and no longer be a sinner, but God declared him innocent of sin, declared him righteous because he trusted God. Romans 3.26 refers to God as being just and the justifier, and that word means the one who declares righteous those who put their faith in Jesus. He declares them innocent in the words of, of King David. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, For our sake, he, God the Father, made him, God the Son, sin, to be sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's the substitutionary atonement. That's the great exchange. That's exactly what David was asking for. Declare me innocent. Now, we don't get all of the machinery of how that needed to happen, that there needed to be a substitute so that God's justice is not swept aside, but instead it's actually fulfilled. We don't see all that, but we get the, the, the gist of it. Declare me innocent. I don't know how this is going to work, but unless you declare me innocent, I'm doomed because I have hidden faults. Declare me innocent from them. That's justification. He's asking for salvation. Look at the next verse. 
Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Brothers and sisters, that's a prayer for sanctification. Jesus said, pray this way, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Romans 6.22 says that we are no longer slaves to sin. We've been freed from that dominion, and we are now slaves to God. It makes it appropriate to pray to God, keep me back from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. That is the result of the legal freedom uh, that we have in Christ, and now we can live it out in practical reality. We can live out freedom from sin as slaves to God so that they don't have dominion over us. And that's exactly the message of Romans 6. You are not dominated by sin anymore. Sin no longer has dominion over you. It's Christ. God in Christ is now your master. That's the dominant force in your life. God, not sin. That's what he prayed for. And look where this ends up. Then, this is a future word, right? He's asking, right now, declare me innocent. Now then, keep me back from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. That's a great description of a life of sanctification. That the Lord is not delivering us, uh, that the Lord is delivering us from temptation and not leading us into evil. We're asking him to help us so that we're kept back from presumptuous sins. And then we need this reality that we're not dominated by sin. That's the sanctified life by the power of the Holy Spirit, described in Romans 6 and many other places. Then, there's only one place to go from there, right? I shall be blameless. Is that prayer going? Is that true? Is there a time coming when David, in every sense of the word, he's now blameless? Yes, when he has a glorified body for all eternity, we get there in Christ and we're made to be like Christ so that now it's appropriate for us to be there in glorified bodies. These bodies of death won't be in this form. It won't be like this. I'll have a body, it'll be me, but it'll be a glorified body. I will not have any, any vestiges of the sinful flesh and it's, it'll be appropriate and right that I'm in the presence of God, the immediate presence of God, because I'll be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Romans 8, 29 and 30 tell us it's predestined that we be conformed to the image of the Son so that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And the word firstborn doesn't mean he, he came into existence doesn't mean any of that. It means that he have a position of preeminence, Paul used to describe it in Colossians, that he, that he be exalted among many brothers. That's the idea. 1 John 3, 2 says, we don't know yet. We haven't seen what we shall be, but we know this. When he returns, we shall see him as he is, and we shall be like him. Amen. Blameless. We're going to live that out. We're going to experience the cleanness of, of worshiping God blamelessly. We're blameless because of what Jesus has done always. And then we have fellowship with God. We will the, the, truly there in glory, the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts will be acceptable in his sight. That's what the word of God does. Listen, do not neglect your Bibles. Read it. Read them. Take up your Bible and read. Read the Bible. It's the Word of God. And that's where you end up, in glory forever. That's the, that's the wonderful effect. Do you rejoice in that? If you do, say praise the Lord. Now, if you're here today and you say, I, I think you're right, but I don't know what the Bible says. Well, you need to start learning. And we'll be glad to help you. The number one thing you need to know is that you're a sinner. You're doomed. The rescue is that God provided Jesus to come in in your place, perfectly fulfill the law, and in your place take the punishment for your sins uh, if you give yourself to him. And he conquered the penalty for sin. The wages of sinners, death. Well, he conquered death. 
Trust Jesus, run to Jesus, cling to him. That's what the Bible says. Thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word. Thank you for the awesome result of your word. Thank you for the victory we have in Jesus. We love you and and depend on you and are so thankful to read about our glorious future. In Jesus' name.